So I will talk about spin decoupling in static and rotating samples. And the static part, of course, will be the same also in liquids. So it's about decoupling in liquid static solids and rotating solids. Now, actually, before we talk about decoupling, we have to talk about the frame we describe experiments in. And there are different frames and different coordinate systems. And this is very, very important, especially for decoupling. So you probably all know the laboratory frame. And this is a frame where the B0 field defines the z-axis, the z-axis of the real space. You have a coil, and typically the coil defines the x-axis of the real space. And then, of course, the y-axis is orthogonal to these two axes that are defined by the B0 field and the B1 field. Now, we have not only a real space, we have also a spin space. And what we typically do, we say, well, our quantization axis is the SZ axis. And the SZ axis is aligned with the static magnetic field. We have an X, SX axis here, and we have an SY axis here. So we have two coordinate systems. We have one that is in real space and the other one that is in the spin space and defined by the spin operators. Now, all measurements that we do, they are done in the lab frame because we use this coil here to actually measure our induced voltage. And this happens in the lab space. Now, if you look at the Hamiltonian in the lab space, you have the Siemens part, you have the chemical shift, you have the dipolar coupling, you have a J coupling, and you have the radio frequency part. And the only part that is time dependent in the lab frame is the radio frequency part. Now we can write our different Hamiltonians in this spherical tensor notation where we have a spatial part, these blue ones here, and we have a spin part, and the spin part are these red ones here. And you see, depending on what interaction we have, for example, for dipolar couplings interaction, we have a rank two description for the chemical shift, we have a rank zero, an isotropic part, so that would be the isotropic chemical shift, and we have anisotropic parts. In this case, there are two. There's a rank one and rank two. But you see all of these here, they are time independent. But of course, we have the radio frequency irradiation. And the radio frequency irradiation is generated by this coil. That will be an oscillation. And this oscillation, that is time dependent. And typically, what we have, we have a linear polarized radio frequency field. So we have a cosine modulation that is in one direction. I want to say a few more words about this spherical tensor. And what you can write is each Hamiltonian you can write in this spherical tensor notation where you have this space part, these A terms, and you have the spin part, these T terms. And if you look at the dipolar coupling as an example, then we have this T20 part. So it's a rank two spin tensor and it's component zero. And you see, this is the typical term that you see in a dipolar coupling. It's three I1 set, I2 set, minus the scalar product I1, I2. And then we have a spatial part here. And the spatial part depends on the Euler angles, on the orientation of our molecule in the external static magnetic field. And this is basically just a complex number that depends on the orientation that tells us how strong is this component in a certain orientation? But then we have also the other ones here, the T21 and the T22, or the A21 and the A22. And all these together, they make up the dipolar coupling Hamiltonian in the lab frame. Of course, we also have, as I already said, the radio frequency Hamiltonian, this oscillating field. And this cosine that we have here that we can actually decompose into two rotating uh, or circular polarized fields. So one that rotates forward and then one that rotates anti-clockwise. If you look at these terms here, you probably have seen the dipolar alphabet, this A, B, C, D, E, F terms. Then this first one here, the T20, A20 term, that would be the A and the B term. These are the one quantum terms, that would be the C and the D, and these are the double quantum terms, the E and the F. 
So we have this lab frame and we have this linear polarized field here. And if we look at this, then what you see here is you see that we have in blue this linear polarized field that oscillates back and backwards and forwards. And we decompose this blue one in the red one that rotates this way and in the green one that rotates in the other way. Now the right, you just see the components, the X, Y and Z components of this linear and these two circular polarized fields. So the reference here is the laboratory frame. So we are in this frame here where we have B naught, we have X and we have Y. We have these two oscillating fields. And what we want to do now is we want to go in a so-called rotating frame. We want to go in a frame where this spin space rotates around this SZ with a certain frequency. And that means that this SY and this SX operator that we have in the lab frame, that they become time dependent with a certain frequency. Now it is important to remember we have two different coordinate systems. We have the real one, the X, Y, Z, the blue ones here, and they are not affected by this rotation. We really rotate in spin space, so we rotate around the SZ operator, the red components, the spin space component. And now the question is what happens if we go in this rotating frame? Now you see the same simulation again, where we sit on the red component here. So we rotate together with this one component. And what happens now is that the green one rotates with twice the frequency in the opposite direction. And the blue one makes a complex uh, motion in this plane. So now the reference frame is the rotating frame. And that means that the laboratory frame is rotating in the reverse direction. If we now look at the RF, what happens to this? If we have this linear polarized RF, we decompose it in these two rotating frames, in these two uh, circular polarized fields. And then we rotate our spin part around the set direction. What we obtain now is that the red part becomes time independent. This is what you see up here. The red part is static here. And the green one is time dependent and rotates in the other direction. So we do this rotating frame transformation for the reason that I just said. We do it to make the radio frequency time independent so we can easier describe our experiment. So what we do is we say we have our total Hamiltonian that has the semen and the other terms. We separate the semen part out. So we split our Hamiltonian in two parts. We have one part that is the semen part and the rest. And now we go in a rotating frame where we use the semen Hamiltonian to transform the rest of our Hamiltonian or the total Hamiltonian into this rotating frame. So we do a rotating frame transformation. And that means now that all of our terms in the Hamiltonian become time dependent. Now, it makes all terms time dependent, but it also makes part of the RF field Hamiltonian time independent. And in the second step now, we say, well, this time dependence that we have here is very, very fast. We just neglect it. We do what is sometimes called a secular approximation. It's a truncation, or you could also say it's a, it's a first order average Hamiltonian treatment. So we throw away all the terms here that are time dependent, and we only retain the time independent part. And of course, this only works if we are, if we have high frequency, if we are at high field. And that's why this is often also called the high field approximation. Let's go back to our dipolar coupling Hamiltonian. So we had this dipolar coupling Hamiltonian with the space part here and with the spin parts here. 
And now we transform them in the rotating frame here. And that means that here on the right hand side, these red parts, they become time dependent. So we have time dependent spin operators. And if you write this up, then you see this T20 term that remains time independent because if you rotate this around the set direction, nothing will happen. You have set operators here. If you rotate them around Z, nothing happens. These are is a is an isotropic term. And if you rotate this, no matter around which direction, it will remain the same. So this here is time independent. But the other two, they become a time dependence with one or two times the Larmor frequency. And these are then exactly the terms that we neglect. So we basically say we cross them out because in first order, they will not contribute the average to zero. And we end up with a Hamiltonian that has only this AL0 and TL0 terms. So all terms that are M equal one or two, they get eliminated by going into the rotating frame and invoking the secular approximation. Now, this is the spin system Hamiltonian that we usually use if we do NMR simulations or NMR theory. This is a Hamiltonian that has no Siemen contribution because by going into this rotating frame, the part that we use to transform into the rotating frame that gets eliminated. And we have now a so-called truncated Hamiltonian. This is what we typically do. If you write out your Hamiltonian in any of the simulation programs, or if you look in any of the books, it's always in the rotating frame. So we have this rotating frame that rotates around the S set operator and that we use because it simplifies the description of our experiments because it makes the radio frequency time independent and because also it eliminates the fast oscillations by the uh, Seemann term that we are typically not interested in. Now we can make this more general. So instead of talking about a rotating frame, we can talk about an interaction frame. And that just means we have a total Hamiltonian and we split it up in two parts. Very often this is a dominant part that for whatever reason has the largest contributions and we have the rest of it. And now we transform the Hamiltonian into an interaction frame with this dominant part, with this H naught part. This removes H naught from the Hamiltonian and at the same time modifies the rest of the Hamiltonian by adding a time dependence, an additional time dependence to it. And this is now an interaction frame Hamiltonian and I use this tilde above the operator to indicate that we are in an interaction frame. Now, going into an interaction frame will not change the physics and it's not an approximation. So basically what, would, what you do is you eliminate this H naught term from the Hamiltonian. It's no longer directly visible, but it's encoded somehow in the complex, more complex time dependent of your H1 of T. Now, of course you can ask, how would we separate the Hamiltonian in these two parts? And this is by no means obvious. There is no clear way of doing this. And very often one can choose different routes and one might be better than the other, but it's not wrong and right. It's just sometimes one is more convenient to see what you want to see. Now we will be talking about decoupling and very often if we do this interaction frame transformation in decoupling, you put this H not of T as the radio frequency field Hamiltonian. So you transform into an interaction frame with your radio frequency field. But there's another choice. You can also use the radio frequency field plus the chemical shift Hamiltonian. And that basically means you go in a tilted frame. Whereas here, you rotate on the X or the Y axis, depending on 
what your radio frequency field is. And we will look at this first in static samples and then in rotating samples and see what we can learn from doing these interaction frame transformations. And then of course, in a second step, we have to do some treatments like average Hamiltonian or Floquet theory in order to get out an effective time independent Hamiltonian. So what couplings do we have here? Clear couplings, you have the J coupling here. The J coupling is an isotropic coupling. That's why you have this zero zero terms for the space and for the spin part. So the J coupling is independent of rotations in real space or in spin space. And we have a dipolar coupling, a homonuclear dipolar coupling. And you see, this is a two T, an A two zero and a T two zero term. So both are second rank tensor terms. And that means they are anisotropic and orientation dependent. And of course, you know, if you do magic angle spinning, we will average out this blue, the spatial part by the rotation around the magic angle. Now we are interested more in heteronuclear couplings and the heteronuclear couplings, again, we have a scalar coupling and a dipolar coupling. And you see the spin part here is an I set S set or a T10 times T10 term. And we have the same terms for the dipolar coupling. So from a decoupling standpoint, the homonuclear, uh, sorry, the, the heteronuclear scalar and the heteronuclear dipolar couplings are exactly the same, except that this term in front of here is different. So the spatial part is either isotropic or anisotropic. But from the spin rotations, they behave exactly the same. So this is what we will be looking at today, the heteronuclear couplings and how we can average them out. We will not look at the homonuclear couplings. They are more complex because they have different spin terms. So let's look at the heteronuclear J or dipolar coupled two spin system. If we do nothing and we record a spectrum of the I spin and the spectrum of the S spin, we see a splitting and the splitting is the coupling. So we have two lines. And now we do an irradiation, a CW irradiation on resonance on the I spins. And of course, you know what happens is these two lines, they will collapse and we get a single line here. Now, why does this happen? And we can again go into a interaction frame by rotating around the radio frequency irradiation and the radio frequency irradiation in this case is the IX operator. So we have an IX irradiation. And what happens is that these set operators that we have in our Hamiltonian, they start rotating around the IX axis. You see the set goes to minus set, the Y builds up, but if you average over these, they will always be zero. So what happens with our Hamiltonian, we have an H naught of T, that is the HRF, and we can transform our Hamiltonian here, that is the H0 plus the H1, and the H0 has the RF irradiation, the H1 has the chemical shift of the S spins and the coupling. We do an interaction frame transformation. And basically, what we do is we place, replace all the I set with these terms here. And if we do this, we get an expression that we have here. So we get a time dependent coupling here and the isotropic chemical shift of the S spin. Now, we cannot always irradiate on resonance. Sometimes we have to irradiate off resonance. So we are not exactly on the line. And that means now that our radio frequency has in addition, or that we have an addition and offset here, and that this offset gives a tilted effective field. So we have a field that is along, no longer along the X axis, but it's slightly tilted and in principle, our J coupling will project onto this tilted field. 
Well, there are two different ways of how we can describe this. We can describe this in the on resonance description, or on resonance maybe is not good. Yeah, it's, it's in the on resonance description, where we have only the radio frequency radiation in our interaction frame transformation. So again, our IZ operator rotates around the X axis, and we get exactly the same picture we had before. But now we have, in addition, this offset here. And this offset also gets modulated by our interaction frame transformation. And we have now this time modulated offset. We have the isotropic chemical shift of the S-pin and the time modulated coupling. Now, I already said this is not the only choice of the interaction frame transformation that we have, that we only put the RF irradiation into our uh, H not term here. We can also put two things in. We can put in the shift and the radio frequency. And what happens then is now that we have this tilted effective field and our I set terms in the interaction frame, they make a more complex trajectory around this tilted field. And now you have not only the X and the Y, not only the, sorry, the the Y and the Z operator, but you have also an X component. If you now look at these and you average over these, you actually get non-zero averages and this will become important. So again, what we do is we set H naught to the sum of the radio frequency and the shift. So we transform into a tilted frame. And if we do this, then we get the isotropic chemical shift of the S-pin and a modulated coupling, but the coupling is now in a more, or shows a more complex modulation. But we don't have the shift anymore of the I-spin, this one, because this we put into the interaction frame transformation. So what we have done is exactly the same what we have done in the rotating frame. We started from a time-independent Hamiltonian, and we make it time-dependent by going into an interaction frame. And in general, for any arbitrary rotation, we can write this interaction frame transformation such that the IZ operator gives a linear combination of the IX, IY, and the IZ operator with these time-dependent coefficients in front. Typically, you can write these time-dependent terms here as a Fourier series because you have a periodic sequence, a sequence that repeats and that has a certain length, a cycle length. You can write this as a Fourier series in the most general case with two frequencies. One frequency is the length of your sequence or the inverse of the length of your sequence. And the other one is the so-called effective field. And the effective field is the rotation that you obtain when you do your pulse sequence once. So some of the sequences, they are cyclic. That means they go back to where they started, like what we had if we had just the RF irradiation for the interaction frame transformation. But some of them are not cyclic. And that means they will not go back to the initial state. And if we now want to describe this decoupling, we have this coupling term. We transform this into our interaction frame. And we get now a coupling that is time dependent. And of course, I just said we can write this as this Fourier series, or we could write the Hamiltonian as such a Fourier series. And now the question is, what do we do with these time-dependent Hamiltonians? Time-dependent Hamiltonians are always difficult. You know this from the Bloch equations. If you have time-dependent B fields, the Bloch equations are difficult to solve. If you have time-dependent Hamiltonians, the Liouville von Neumann equation is difficult to solve. And what we typically do is we try to approximate these time-dependent Hamiltonians by time-independent effective or average Hamiltonians. 
So we start with the Hamiltonian that has such a Fourier series. We have here the omega m and the omega effective, and we have this Fourier coefficients. And then we can do different theories, average Hamiltonian theory or Floquet theory, which is the one I prefer. And you can do a serious expansion and try to approximate this Hamiltonian, this effective Hamiltonian, by a series that gives you better and better uh, answers to how your Hamilton, your density operator evolves. Now, if you have only a single frequency up here, your first order effective Hamiltonian is just a time independent part of the Hamiltonian, of this time dependent Hamiltonian here. The second order is a commutator term, and the third order would be a double commutator term. If you have two frequencies, things are a bit more complex. Then your first order is a sum over all so called resonant terms. And resonant terms means that K naught omega m plus L naught omega effective is equal to zero. Of course, this could also be zero, zero, but there could be more terms where you match these two frequencies to sum to zero that come in to the first order effective Hamiltonian. And we will talk about this a little bit more when we come to magic angle spinning. The second order is again, these commutator terms. And you can calculate them, you can see what happens. So what we need to know actually are these Fourier coefficients of the Hamiltonian. In order to get them, what we do is we take this interaction frame trajectories that we saw and we Fourier transform them. And if you have a CW irradiation, you remember we only had the ZX, uh, sorry, the ZY and the ZZ term, but not the ZX term. And if you Fourier transform the cosine modulation that you have here, this is the uh, ZZ term, then you get plus one half and minus one half here. And if you Fourier transform the sine here for the X, for the Y component, you get plus i half and minus i over two. You see these two terms, they are in this case at two omega m. <coughs> they are two omega m because I notated here over two basic cycles. We do this tilted frame transformation we get something more complex because we get these two frequencies. We get the omega m and we get the omega effective here. And you see, we have now all three terms here, but we also have a zero, zero term here in the middle. And this zero, zero term, that is very important because this terms here, they will show up in the first order effective Hamiltonian. So if we have this heteronuclear spin system, we do on resonance RF irradiation, we go in into, into the interaction frame with just the radio frequency field, and we calculate what our, our different orders of the effective Hamiltonian we find the first order is just the isotropic chemical shift of the S-spin. The second order gives a cross term between the coupling with itself. And the third order gives actually a coupling term. So this would be the first term that contributes to a residual splitting in our S-spin here. If we irradiate off resonance, but we do this on resonance description, so we go only with the radio frequency field Hamiltonian in the interaction frame, we get again a first order Hamiltonian that has only the isotropic chemical shift of the S spin. In second order, we get a cross term actually between the chemical shift of the I spin and the coupling. And this is the coupling term, an S set IX term. It looks a bit different than normal coupling, but it will do the same. It will split the line. And this is what is classically known as off-resonance decoupling. 
get an effective coupling here, which is given by this expression. And that means your decoupling will not be perfect. And in third order, you get additional terms. So in this case, your quality of the decoupling will actually show up in the second order of the effective Hamiltonian. Now we could also go into a frame, an interaction frame, where we actually put the chemical shift of the eye spin and the radio frequency irradiation into the H naught and do an interaction frame transformation with that part. And what we get then is a first order effective Hamiltonian that contains all this A set X zero zero term. So we get here a residual coupling, a scaled coupling. And of course, we would also get second and third order terms. So depending on how we choose the interaction frame, our residual coupling will show up in different orders of our effective Hamiltonian. And in this case, it shows already up in the first order. And we can directly take this from these uh, zero, zero terms of our interaction frame trajectory. Of course, you know, we don't do CW decoupling. We do more complex trajectories. We do more complex pulse sequences, for example, walls or something like this that notate the spin around in a more complex way. And, uh, sorry, I'm to see whether I can go back. So, so this would be walls 16, the on resonance description. So we go in an interaction frame only with a radio frequency field. And you see now what our I set does in the interaction frame, it goes forward and backward. It does a complex trajectory, but it always just goes in the Y set plane. And you see here how this trajectory are, you see, see the three components. Now, of course, we could also go in this frame where we use the radio frequency and the offset to go into the interaction frame. And then we get a much more complex trajectory of our IZ operator in this interaction frame. You see this also here. Now we have all three components, the red, the blue, and the black. So we have the ZX, the ZY, and the ZZ component. And this will tell us then in the end how good the decoupling is when we do our Fourier transformation. So we have the on resonance case. We do a Fourier transformation. We have only a single frequency, the modulation frequency. The effective field is zero. You see, you only have components on this zero omega effective here. We only have the A set Z and the A set Y because we rotate around the X axis, so nothing is here. If we go in the interaction frame with the chemical shift offset, then we have not only the modulation frequency, but we have an effective field. And you see now that we have contributions everywhere. But if you look here in the middle where the zero zero components are, they are very, very small. And this is actually what these sequences like waltz or dipsy or flopsy or whatever, what they do is they make these zero zero components as small as possible. And that will improve the coupling over a wider range of chemical shift offsets. So on resonance, we can again describe this by going in this interaction frame. In this case, our sequence is cyclic. So after a full cycle, we are back where we started in the interaction frame. And these are so-called symmetric sequences. So if you look from the front and from the back, they look the same. And if they are symmetric, then the even orders of the effective Hamiltonian, they are zero. So if we now calculate our effective Hamiltonian for this on resonance description, the first order is zero. The second order is zero because it's a symmetric sequence. And in third order, we would get our first residual contribution to the coupling. If we describe this in the frame where we take the chemical shift offset also in the interaction frame, 
we get actually our residual coupling already in the first order. Now the sequence is no longer cyclic. It's also not symmetric. So we can't use these nice properties that we have here, but we get our residual coupling already in the first order of the effective Hamiltonian. And they are basically given by the scaling factors from the Fourier transformation. And of course we could calculate second or third order contributions. So we have this on resonance and this off resonance description. So in one case, we only include the radio frequency in the interaction frame uh, transformation. In the other case, we include also the chemical shift. And what we get in the end, of course, is the same result, but we get the residual couplings in much lower order if we do this off resonance description. Now, if you do average Hamiltonian theory, it is much easier to do this on resonance description. And this is the reason why if you look at the classic paper where liquid state enamatic coupling is described, then you typically see an interaction frame where only the radio frequency is included. But I personally think that if you include the chemical shift offset into the interaction frame, it is much more efficient and you get your answer actually in a much simpler way. But of course, there's a trade-off and the trade-off is that the cyclic and the symmetric feature of the sequence are no longer there. Now, decoupling in static solids or in liquids is mostly a question of compensating offset effects. And if you want to compensate offset effects, then this description, this tilted frame description, this off resonance description is the simplest to do. Okay, so decoupling in static solids is just about offsets. Now we turn on magic angle spinning, just to remind you, it was invented in 1958 by Andrew and Lowy. And it evolved from relatively slow spinning, one kilohertz in the beginning, to something like 170 kilohertz spinning in 2020. Rotors going down from maybe four to five millimeter to nowadays the fastest 0.5 millimeter. How do we do this? We have a rotor that we put in a stator. We have gas bearings here to keep the friction low. We have a turbine here. We have a coil to generate radio frequency fields and an optical fiber to actually measure the spinning frequency. This is a home built probe from Argo Samuelson's group that uh, we use in our lab. See the actual spinning mechanism here and the rest of course is all the radio frequency stuff. And you can see different rotors here. This is from uh, the Warwick group, this photo. And you see we have different sizes rotor up to the smallest that are about 0.5 millimeter. What does magic angle spinning do? Magic angle spinning averages this spatial part, these A parts that I have shown you. And depending on around which axis we rotate them, they scale differently. If we rotate them around the set axis, nothing happens. If we rotate them around the 90 degree angle, so around the X axis, they get scaled by minus one half. And somewhere in between here, we scale them to zero. And this is the so-called magic angle, 54.74 degrees. But again, this is not perfect the scaling because we rotate with a finite spinning frequency and we will have higher order terms that make the averaging incomplete. Now, if we take a sample, let's say a carbon spectrum, uh, of a small compound. This is probably MLF, I think it is, yep. Uh, no, it's not true, it's, it's, it's a dipeptide valfate. Uh, where we spin at different frequencies, you see our lines get narrower because we average the dipolar couplings. 
But you see, even with the spin, 40 kilo, 50 kilohertz, and this is a somewhat older slide, but now even if you would spin 100 or 150 kilohertz, it would not be perfectly decoupled. Only if you add decoupling to the protons will you get these much sharper lines that you see up here. So we need decoupling even under fast matching angle spinning. But maybe if we could spin something like 250 or 300 kilohertz, we would need no decoupling for the dipolar coupling, but we would still have the isotropic J couplings that we would have to decouple. Now, if you want to describe decoupling in rotating solids, we have to start from the Hamiltonian under magic angle spinning. And the Hamiltonian under magic angle spinning is time dependent. We have this e to the i and omega r terms in here for the dipolar coupling and for the chemical shift, the anisotropic chemical shift. So this is a simplified Hamiltonian. It only has the dipolar coupling and the chemical shift, no J coupling and no CSA for the S spin. And of course, we also have the radio frequency radiation. Now we do exactly the same what we did before. We go in an interaction frame with the radio frequency irradiation. And this will make our Hamiltonian even more time dependent. So we already have the time dependence here for magic angle spinning, these two here. But now we get this time dependence, this additional time dependence through the interaction frame transformation that eliminates our radio frequency field. And we end up with a Hamiltonian that has three frequency the spinning frequency from the MIS, the modulation frequency that comes from the length of the sequence, and potentially an effective field if the sequence is not cyclic. And that means now that our Hamiltonian will always have two, or in many cases, three different frequencies. Now we do exactly the same. We do again Floquet theory in this case to go from this time dependent Hamiltonian to an effective Hamiltonian in different orders, first, second, and third. You see them here for two frequencies and three frequencies. So we have here these resonant terms, and again, these resonant terms. And in second order, we have the commutator terms. Now, what we want to do is we want to make this term very, very small if we do decoupling. We want to minimize this term because this will be the leading term for the residual coupling, the second order term. And the reason why in this case, the second order and not the third order term is the leading term is because we cannot make our sequence um, symmetric because that would require that we invert the rotation of the magic angle spin. So our sequence will never be cyclic under magic angle spinning. And that means the second order will not be zero, even if we go in this on resonance frame just with the radio frequency irradiation. So we will always have second order contribution. And there are two different types of contributions that are important for decoupling under magic angle spinning. And one is a term which is a cross term between the I spin CSA and the heteronuclear dipolar coupling. This gives this two spin coupling term and terms that look like this. Or we can have a cross term between the heteronuclear and the homonuclear dipolar coupling. And this will be a, marked as D cross D, and this will be marked as D cross CSA. This is a three spin term, but again, it will give you a residual coupling. Now, this dipole CSA cross terms you get if you have a non-zero effective field, so in CW decoupling or TPPM decoupling, or if you include that effects, whereas this dipole-dipole cross terms you get for sequences that have no effective field. So for example, XIX, and I will come to what these sequences are in a minute. Now, it's not only these second order terms that are important, but it's also something new that appears. And that is so-called these resonance conditions. And these resonance conditions, 
they come about because you can match now the spinning frequency with the modulation frequency. If you do this, you get additional terms, resonant terms here, that can be very, very big. And if these resonant terms are the wrong ones, for example, if they contain heteronuclear couplings, it will destroy your decoupling. So what we have to do is we have these second order non-resonant terms. These are the residual couplings. And we have the first or second order resonant terms and they actually might destroy our decoupling. This is the line intensity of the CH2 group in glycine as a function of our RF field amplitude. So we do CW decoupling. We spin at 68.5 kilohertz and we look at the line intensity. Now you see here the line intensity is relatively high. So here actually the decoupling works. Here it's also relatively high for low radio frequency fields. So here the decoupling also works. But you see here in between and here and here, we have suddenly dips where the line intensity is low and low line intensity means broad lines. And that means the decoupling does not work very well here. And this is because we have here resonance conditions that reintroduce the dipolar coupling, the so-called rotary resonance conditions. So if we want to understand the coupling in rotating solids, we write down our time dependent Hamiltonian in the interaction frame. We do flow theory, we do first order and second order resonant and non-resonant terms. And then we have the residual coupling and the residual coupling basically tells us how broad is the line under this decoupling sequence without any other influence. But of course, this is not the reality. There are other things that come in. And one thing, of course, are the resonance conditions. And you have seen just now the resonance conditions, they can be quite broad. So they can broaden your line and destroy your decoupling. And there's something else, and I will not talk much about this. This is spin diffusion on the protons. And the spin diffusion that actually leads to an additional averaging of the residual couplings this was found very early in 1976 by Sinning and Mehring and Pines and was called self-decoupling. And it's basically an exchange process. So what you have to think about is you say, you have a residual coupling that gives you a splitting between the two lines. And you know now if you have two lines and you have an exchange process, this exchange is faster than the splitting of the two lines, you get an averaging and you actually get sharper lines. So it's the interplay of these three things, the residual coupling, these are the non-resonant terms, the resonance conditions or the closeness to resonance conditions and the spin diffusion that actually determines how our line looks after decoupling. I want to show you here a little bit of pathological example. So this is a trimethyl ammonium chloride where the methyl groups are all deuterated. So we have here basically a two spin system, 15N proton two spin system. Proton spin diffusion is very slow because we have all these here deuterated and there is relatively low proton density. If you just do magic angle spinning, no decoupling, you get a nice sharp line with a J coupling of 90 Hertz roughly. And now you decouple with a 100 kilohertz CW field at seven Tesla, now you get actually a broad line and you get a line that is split. This is not what you would usually expect. You have a narrow line without decoupling, you decouple and the line gets broader. What you see here is actually this residual coupling. So in this case, this is the dipolar CSA cross term, and we can show it's the dipolar CSA cross term. by are going from seven to 14 Tesla. You see your line gets much broader, about twice as broad, because now your CSA is twice as big. Now, of course, you can say, if I do 
NMR and I decouple, usually see a, I see a narrowing of the line. And the reason why you don't see this here is because you have these isolated two spin systems and you don't have spin diffusion. What the spin diffusion now would do, it would average these two lines. You would get a sharp line in the middle. But here, the spin diffusion is not effective because it's too slow. But this illustrates very nicely that we have actually under CW decoupling, a very bad decoupling. The residual couplings, they are much bigger than we think. And without the spin diffusion, we would never see sharp lines. So coming back to this CW picture that I showed you at the beginning, we actually have two regimes where we can do decoupling. One regime is so-called high power decoupling. And that is where your decoupling field is significantly bigger than your spinning frequency. Or you can do low power decoupling where your CW field, the RF amplitude is significantly smaller than your spinning frequency. And in between decoupling is difficult. It's not impossible. There are some sequences that also work reasonable well in here, but typically as a general rule, I think we can say we do either work in the high power or in the low power regime. And I will talk mostly about the high power regime today. So what sequences do we have? There are actually three basic sequences. There's CW, where we have a irradiation with a certain phase that does not change. We have TPPM decoupling, where we have a pulse of length tau p and phase phi, and then we switch the phase to the negative value. So you see, we have two pulses, same length, and we switch the phase from plus to minus. We have XIX decoupling, where we have again two pulses, same length. We switch the phase by 180 degrees. So in some sense, you could say XIX is a special case of TPPM, where this phi is pi half. There are many modification of these basic sequences. And maybe we should say the history, 1950 was CW decoupling. It took until 1995 before the first multiple pulse decoupling sequence that was universal applicable was developed in Bob Griffin's lab. And then there is this XIX sequence that was first described by Piotr Tekeli in 1994 and then later on in our group for much faster magic angle spinning. Now, what modifications are there? It's mostly modification of the TPPM sequence. So there's spinal 64, where we change the phase and do a super cycle. So instead of just having plus minus phi, we now have an alpha and a beta that is added to the phi. And we do a super cycle, this Q, Q bar. So we invert, invert the phases and we do this complex thing. So this will be a very, very long sequence. The problem is you have to optimize all these different phases and the pulse lengths. So it's a very complex sequence. The question is, how do you choose these phases and pulse length? There's SWF TPM, TPPM or sweet, uh, frequency swept TPPM, where the phase is always kept the same, but the length of the pulse are changed during the decoupling. This is from Matthew's lab and was described in 2006. There's XIX CW, where you actually make the amplitude of one of the pulses higher or one of the pulses longer. So this is actually an XIX sequence where you have in addition an effective field. And there is the group of RCW sequences, which are closely related to the XIX sequences, but where you not switch the phase of your pulse, but you have a pi pulse in between that is 90 degree phase shifted. This was actually developed by Asif Ekbal in Niels Nielsen's group. Now, I will not try to describe all these different sequences and the theory behind it, but what I will do is I will 
show you the TPPM and derived sequences. And I will show you a little bit how they work. I want to say only one thing about XIX. What you see here is a plot of, again, the line intensity of the CH2 group in glycine. As a function of this pulse length tau p, it printed here in fractions of the rotor period. So here, our pulse lengths would be two rotor periods, three rotor periods, and four rotor periods. You see many resonance conditions. Everywhere where the intensity is low, the line is broad, and that means there's a resonance condition. And actually, decoupling in rotating solids is mostly avoiding resonance conditions. And you have to find a point where you have no nearby resonance conditions. And for XIX, this is typically close to three rotor cycles, but not at three rotor cycles. You also see that this XX sequence gets much better if you go to higher RF field amplitudes. So going from 100 to 150 kilohertz gives you a lot of advantage. This is all I want to say about the XX decoupling. It's really avoiding the resonance conditions. And the faster you spin, the narrower the resonance conditions get, and it's easier to avoid them. These are actually one of the few experimental spectra that I show. This is an optimization plot of TPPM decoupling. You have two parameters, the pulse length and the phase. Here the phase is varied. Here the pulse length is varied, varied for different conditions. And you see the coupling is good here, 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 and here for these four different experimental conditions, different spinning frequencies, different RF field amplitudes. You see the optimum is at very different positions. And the question is, why is this? So what we can do is we can calculate the so-called the second order terms, this dipole CSA or dipole dipole terms for TPPM at 100 kilohertz and the spinning frequency of 15 kilohertz. Now you see that there is an area here, which is close to a pi pulse where the decoupling is good or where the second order cross terms are weak, low. You also see the dipole-dipole cross terms, they are zero. So we have no dipole-dipole cross terms. We only have the dipole CSA cross terms. And we can also look at the resonance conditions. And the resonance conditions are plotted here on top for different spinning frequencies. They, they, of course, they change with the spinning frequency. And the color coding in these plots here tells you how strong the resonance condition is. If it's dark red, you recouple fully the heteronuclear dipolar coupling. So on these resonance conditions, you have the dipolar coupling back. And that, of course, means you will have no decoupling. You see, if you spin faster, these resonance conditions, they move into the area where the decoupling would be good. But of course, this is not what you want, because if you are too close to these resonance conditions, decoupling will not work anymore. Now, you have seen in the spinal, we make the sequence longer and longer. And we can ask ourselves, what happens if we make the sequence longer and longer? So here I now do four cycles of TPPM. And you see there are many more potential resonance conditions. Here we had only this four here. Now we have many, many more because our cycle time is longer and the basic frequency is smaller. But of course we have not changed the sequence. So only these two here, they are non-zero and the other ones are potential ones, but they are not realized. We go to 32 cycles of TPPM like the spinal does. We see the same. We have many, many more potential resonance conditions. But if we keep the sequence the same, if we keep it TPPM, we have only these three here that are actually non-zero. So now we can go to TPPM 64. And this is a super cycled version of TPPM where we do this R, R bar, R bar, R, and then this other one here. 
And what you see is that our second order terms, they become much broader. The area where the second order terms are small, they become much broader. But on the other hand, if you look at the resonance conditions, you see we have now resonance conditions everywhere. But you also see that these resonance conditions, they have low intensity, they are blue. So they're 10 to the minus four. Of course, there are some red ones in between here. So we have to be very, very careful. So supercycling increases the area where we have low second order, low residual couplings. But it makes the sequence longer. And if you make the sequence longer, then you have more potential resonance condition. And again, like in the XX, it's now all about the question, can we avoid the resonance conditions? We can get one step further and go to spinal 64, where we have not only the supercycling, but in addition, the phase modulation. You see now our second order terms or the residual couplings where they are small is in a, again, a larger area, but it's different from what we had before. Of course, we can also calculate our resonance conditions. And you see, again, we have many resonance conditions, but at slower spinning frequency, they are all small and there are areas where there is no resonance condition. So we can find areas here where we can go to, do good decoupling. If you go to higher spinning frequencies to 30 kilohertz and keep the RF field the same, you see it gets much more difficult because we have a lot of strong resonance conditions now in there. So this super cycling and the phase modulation that uh, gives you again, a larger area of lower uh, residual couplings, but it also gives you many resonance conditions. If you look at it from a theoretical standpoint, there's actually not much improvement of spinal 64 over a supercycled TPPM, but I don't think anybody has tested this uh, experimentally. So I don't know whether this is true. This is SWF, the frequency swept TPPM. You see actually this has a very, very nice area where your second order terms are small. So where you have small residual coupling. It's actually much nicer, a much nicer and a much more well-defined area than in the spinal. We can again look at resonance conditions. You see at least at smaller spinning frequencies, there are not so many resonance conditions. There's a large spacing between them. But even if we go to higher spinning frequencies, you see in this area, the resonance conditions, they are all blue, they are low. So we have small couplings that are reintroduced. So this is actually, I think, from a theoretical standpoint, the best decoupling sequence. Now, you can say, what should I use when I do decoupling? And I'm very pragmatic there by now. I would say, rely on the experience of other people in your lab have gained over time. Different spectrometer samples probably might favor different sequences. But I think it's also important to get a feeling for the optimization required for the sequences used in the lab. And what I think is also important, build up your own experience, try out different sequences, optimize them, check how they work and try to find out what works best for you. I think the differences between the different sequences are relatively small if they are all properly optimized. It's more about the question, how easy are they to optimize? And can you use them on complex samples without optimizing them? And at least from a theoretical standpoint, I think this, that the frequency swap TPPM looks best in that. But this is also true experimentally, there are some papers about this, is not so clear. So this was all about the high power decoupling. And I want to say a little bit something about the low power decoupling. So I already said in between it's inefficient. And down here, the low power decoupling, that works only if you spin fast. So we have here low power CW decoupling, 35 kilohertz and 68 kilohertz. 
you so see down here, this does not work. So I would say if you spin 60 or faster, or maybe 50 and faster, low power decoupling is an, is an option. CW decoupling is not very good, but of course you can use all these sequences. You can use XX, XX, CW, TPPM, SWF, TPPM, probably also spinal. You could even use something like walls if you spin very, very fast, and if you need mostly bandwidth. The sequences, they actually all give very similar results. It's more a question of optimization. XIX is probably the worst at this low power. XIX CW is much better. But again, it depends on how well they are optimized. This is about what I want to say, but of course there's one important thing you have to keep in mind. The coupling is not the only contribution to the line width. There are many other sources of line width that come on top of the residual or the imperfect decoupling that you have. You might have temperature gradients. If your chemical shifts are temperature dependent, they will distribute. You have B0 field homogeneity, the shim, if this is not perfect. You have B1 field inhomogeneities that contribute, setting of the magic angle that contribute, sample homogeneity or heterogeneity and susceptibility effects are very, very important. And then of course you have all the spin dynamics. This is what we talked about, the decoupling efficiency, resonance effects. Of course you also have real relaxation. You have homonuclear J couplings that might make your lines proud. You have experimental imperfections like phase transients that come in and all these things. So keep in mind, that many of them will also contribute to the line width. With this, I would like to end and say thank you to the people I have worked with over the years, my current group here in Zurich, former group members that some of them worked on the decoupling. And of course, also people I have worked with, it started with Alex Pines when I did a postdoc, that is where all this interest in averaging came up where we looked at this first, then later with Beat Meyer, where I worked or who I collaborated with for a long time. We did a lot of these interesting work about different decoupling sequences. And of course, all the other people that I collaborated with, Madhu and Paul Hodgkinson. And so thank you all for your contribution and thank you for your attention and for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. So now for the audience, you can type questions in the, in the Q&A feature um, of, the, of the webinar, that would be best. Um, and then you can also vote if you want, if you have a, a question that is already um, asked. Um, maybe I'll just start. Um, so I, that you have some time to write questions. So uh, Matthias, I was wondering, um, you of course have a very theoretical approach. So do you think that simulations can help people like avoiding resonance conditions and finding good parameters or is this still far away? I think this is still far away. I mean, it's more to understand the principles and to see how these different things interact and what you have to do, but I don't think that you can, um, maybe if you use very big spin system like Ilya Kuprov does in the spinach approach, you could try to optimize sequences based on simulations. But, you know, in most cases, I think it's much easier to optimize them experimentally and start with the small molecule where you have enough signal to noise that you can actually do these 2D or even 3D plots that show you the decoupling efficiency. I think the theory is more about understanding things and understanding how different things interact and how this happens. Okay. Um, and then maybe one more. So do you think there is a still room for improvement or for, for developing new sequences? like maybe for fast MIS or, or in other? I think not in terms of the achievable line width. I think for most um, 
most of the seek or most of the samples that we have, the decoupling probably does not limit, or the the line width is not limited by the decoupling, but by other parameters. Now, if you have spin echo sequences, that might be different, where you can refocus a lot of these other contributions. Um, but I think what one could still improve is the stability of the sequences. So sequences that work very well over a large range of parameters, where you basically can use the sequence without optimization. And there has some work been done, especially for uh, the RCW and the XIXCW in the low power cases, where you can basically relatively straightforward predict where your sequence will be good. And of course, that is important if you have a low signal to noise and not too many uh, and can't do a, a large optimization. Okay. Uh, so Amrit had a question in the chat, probably kind of posted to the QSA. I quickly read it. I had a question about the fractional rotary resonance, omega one equals omega r third condition that you showed. What interactions are reintroduced under that condition? I was a bit surprised to see the intensity reducing more at that fractional resonance condition than the standard horror condition. So at the standard horror condition, you reintroduce the homonuclear diploid coupling. So what happens there is, let me see whether I can go back to this. Yep. So here we are at the horror condition. And the horror condition actually helps you because it reintroduces the homonuclear diploid coupling. And the homonuclear diploid coupling will lead to this uh, self decoupling that I described briefly. So actually, here you speed up spin diffusion and that makes your line narrower because you have exchange between the alpha and beta states and that gives you the narrow line. Now here you actually recouple a heteronuclear diploid coupling. There's, there are, actually many more of these fractional rotary resonance. There's also one at a quarter. Um, I think there is a paper by Jakob van Beek uh, where all of these different fractional rotary resonance conditions are described and which describes which terms come back. Some of them are homonuclear, some of them are heteronuclear, and I don't remember all of this in, uh, in detail, but I can give you a reference for this. Okay, uh, then we have a question from anonymous attendee. Uh, thank you for the nice lecture. You start out saying that the spin parts are time dependent. If molecules move, would not also the space parts be time dependent and stochastic? This motion might be faster than the pulse sequence. How would this affect the coupling? Okay, I mean, I said in the very beginning, our Hamiltonian is static. And of course, this is only true for static molecules. Now, if you think about solution, your molecules tumble fast, very, very fast. And that will average out your anisotropic interactions. And of course, again, the tumbling is not infinitely fast. So you will see effects of this averaging. And these effects, this is what makes relaxation. So you can do Redfield theory or any other relaxation theory. And that tells you then that this tumbling will actually average, uh, this, this tumbling will generate a decay of your coherences and the decay of your populations. I should be more careful there, that's true. I should have said it's static molecules, they tumble, then you have this additional relaxation. Uh, okay, then another question. I'm not sure if it's actually decoupling related, but maybe I'm overlooking. So thank you for the comprehensive presentation. I realized that small rotors, uh, 1.9 millimeters, have Vespel caps that contribute to 1H NMR spectra. May you give an advice to avoid this signal without losing the quantitative aspect? Pooh. Use other caps. <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I think there's no easy way of getting rid of them. Of course, what you could do is you, if you have a, a sample that is labeled, carbon-13 labeled, you could do a, a filter through the carbon-13. 
but uh, otherwise I don't know how you would easily get rid of the signal from the caps compared to the signal of your sample. Both is rotating and I don't know. Okay, uh, then there's a follow-up question to this relaxation question. I understand that relaxation arises, but does the spatial motion also affect the coupling performance? Uh, that's a good question. Yes, it does. I mean, yes, it does, and no, it doesn't, depending on what you what you. So, if your if your spatial motion is very very fast, then it will not interfere with the decoupling. But of course, if your motion is on the same order of or on the same time scale as your decoupling, then of course it will interfere with the averaging. And people have seen like uh, things like this. For example, if you have an exchange process where you have a spatial modulation going on, an exchange, then you see that if your decoupling is in the same order of or the, the same time scale, that the decoupling breaks down. You also see this, for example, I think in internal motions of molecules, if they are slow, they might interfere with the decoupling. And then to describe this all theoretically is possible, you can do a stochastic Liouville equation, where you basically do uh, include all these phenomena, but then you will see that there are potential interferences between these. I hope that answers the question. 